By the end of the summer of 1972, we completed the Wicked Lester record. Gene and I both hated the album. We sat down together, just the two of us, and decided we didn't want to release it. No band, no label, no gear, no problem. Uh, probably before I was in Kiss, I, I did a gig in Patterson, New Jersey. Huh? I was actually filling in for another guitar player. And uh, I pissed off the owner because I was playing too loud the whole night. And I got a little drunk. And at the end of the night, they didn't pay me what they said they were going to pay me. And I said, well, I want what you told me you were going to pay me. And he says, well, you better go to the, to the boss. So I go to the, the club owner, and he was this mafia guy. And I said, I want, I want my money. Next thing you know, I was on the floor. He fractured my cheekbone. We made finding a lead guitar player our initial priority. Only instead of looking for a lead guitar player, we decided to seek out a drummer. Eventually, we found an interesting ad in Rolling Stone and rang the number. We had one line of questioning. Would you do anything to make it? Yeah, said the guy on the other end of the line. Would you wear a dress? Yeah. We arranged to meet the guy in front of Electric Lady down on 8th Street. He was dressed very cool, cooler than us. He looked quite a bit older than I was, and he had about five names. George, Peter, John, Chris, Gola, blah, 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 but he went by Peter, Chris. We walked to a pizza joint and sat down with our slices. We hadn't been talking for five minutes when Peter blurted out, I have a nine-inch dick. I didn't know what to say. Pass the cheese? What? This guy was very different from us. Peter could barely read or spell, and he wasn't a thinker. When I grew my hair long, I got my ass kicked. Every day, catching a train to go down to the village and learn how to play, or wanted to play with everybody who jammed in the parks down there. And uh, that seemed to have veered off somewhere into some place that our message of, like, you know, if you want it, you hang in there, you'll get it, your dreams will come true. Guitar player wanted with flash and balls. That was the ad we placed in the village voice. And when we opened the door to our rehearsal space on the appointed day in December 1972, we had a lot of takers, more than 30. After a long and mostly fruitless freak show, a guy walked in wearing one red sneaker and one orange sneaker. He was about my age and kind of goofy and pigeon-toed. While we were still talking, this other guy plugged in his guitar and started playing. Hey man, shut up and wait your turn, we told him. You know, I am the spaceman, the one and only, and you know. Eventually, we plugged in with him, and almost from the minute we started playing, something happened that took us to a completely different place. This is it. This is lethal. This is the goods. When I was 15 years old, I cut school and went to a Murray the K show somewhere in Midtown. Uh, it was Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, but lo and behold, the two bands opening for them were the Who and the Cream. So I was completely floored by both of their performances and became an automatic fan. And the cream were amazing and amazing musicians, but they just stood there. And, you know, from that time on, you know, I knew that at one point I wanted to be in a theatrical rock group. And we all know what happened, right? <laughs> Ace had swagger, that's for sure. His playing reminded me of guys I really liked, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck. He was also a total oddball. He moved in a rubbery way and barely spoke. He shrugged his shoulders a lot. Once we had solidified the foursome, we rehearsed seven days a week. The first of the three gigs was on January 30th, 1973. Ace turned up late and refused to carry anything, not one thing. Then as we were unloading it, Ace pulled out his penis totally out of the blue and said, This is my dick without a heart on. Huh? Whatever. I didn't know what was up with Ace and Peter and their dick size obsessions. Huh? Though as time went on, I began to suspect that this was the way they defined themselves and what was important to them. Jerry Nolan from the New York Dolls was my closest friend. I don't know if people know that, but we grew up together in Brooklyn. Uh, we went to school together. He gave my first drum lesson. It was like, I was jealous actually when he got the Dolls because they were so cool. They were such a force in New York to reckon with. They were, Everyone loved the dolls in New York. It was funny, New York was the only place in the world they were famous. I think their album, Too Much Too Soon, was a good title. Because <laughs> that was the only one they ever did, yeah. never did know it. But Jerry was a type of guy that loved to, image was extremely important, as important as the music, I think more so with those guys. Looking great, looking, uh, they looked adorable. Uh, they looked like chicks with the eyeliner and the chick boots. We tried it and looked like we were in drag. 
look like four guys in drag. Gene's a big guy. <laughs> he looked like a, you know, an old whore from some old whorehouse. And so we realized that makeup, that the glam didn't look great on us. It wasn't going to fly for us. But we knew we wanted to do something that no one else ever did in the world. And we had a, a, a chemistry to it. And we wanted to be the Beatles. We wanted to be four guys that each one of us was like John Paul Ringo and George and everyone loved each one of us separately but all together they loved us like immensely and that was we thought wow what a great idea it was like kind of when we saw Alice Cooper he was the only one who had makeup on no one else did so we thought what would it be like if four guys had the makeup on and the four guys all shared the limelight. <laughs> it was great that those days are gone. And everything went crazy. And everybody got ego crazy and money and all those bad things started happening, drugs and everything else. But the idea was brilliant. Somehow wearing white face paint went hand in hand with our new outfits. Together in our loft on 23rd Street, we all sat around looking at a mirror on the back of the door. We had no idea how to apply makeup. It was as if we were possessed, just smearing makeup on, wiping it off, trying different things. The only measure of whether the images worked was the extent to which each guy felt comfortable in his. The images all enhanced or reinforced characteristics in each of us, and in that way, they weren't just costumes. I'm not that I'm a big cat fan, but I'm pretty much like one. You know, there's a lot of my character. That, you know, I I I I can be incredibly vicious, and yet I can be very lovable. I I find my temper can be wow, or it can be soothing. And and I was one night just sketching. Uh, we were all all the all the guys in the group are really good artists, and I was drawing all these crazy costumes that I wanted to do. And I had this big black alley cat, and I kept staring at this crazy animal, looking at its face, and I got this crazy notion to start drawing its face on my body in in kind of contour with my my face brought it into the guys and said well, what do you think of this and everyone yeah that's you man that's you and until today i guess i'm still a cat on the prowl the kiss makeup that i designed is so distinctive you know i don't think i could top it and you know i didn't even want to go there you got to remember i was wearing that makeup for i don't know how many years and uh, it got to the got to the point where you know i got to put this on again so when it came time to leave the band, and when I had made that decision, I really was, had no, no desire to put makeup on again. And I still don't to this day, you know? I mean, you know, if the price was right, yeah, I might do it, but, you know, it's really a big pain in the ass, to be honest with you. From this point on, we began to create a world that we ultimately inhabited and ruled. But at the start, we certainly weren't at the center of anything. We weren't part of the clique of New York bands. We weren't junkies. We didn't hang out at the Chelsea Hotel trying to relive somebody else's past. Some of us could carry on at least semi-intelligent conversations, and that wasn't cool. We were the outcasts of the outcasts. There's a time that we sat together back in the day when we were really a band, the band. You know, ate the same crap, shared rooms, holiday inns died out here blue black in a bathtub walked through Greenwich Village got hit with eggs and bombs you know never got any airplay never got anything great we were like the worst band considered in the world uh, and uh, you know got thrown off the shows and eventually almost got thrown off the label you know I mean no one liked us back in the day we really paid our dues but we hung in tough we went through it you know that and we hung tight and we we became whatever we became today and I'm really proud of that it was a benchmark in my career it was, you know, the first time I, my face was on a record ever. Kiss was the first time I, I released a, an album. I remember going to Alexander's on, on Fordham Road in the Bronx and buying the record. I was looking at it and going, wow, this is real. And then I remember the first time I was driving in a car with a friend and uh, one of the Kiss songs came on the radio. And that was a real special moment. Gene and I knew we would be depended on to bring in the songs for Kiss because Peter and Ace never showed much ambition in that department. I didn't begrudge them their limitations, but when Ace showed up with the framework of a song, I was thrilled. After all, we wanted to be like the Beatles, four identifiable characters. Oh, I don't know. Led Zeppelin 1. Fresh Cream, Disraeli Gears, you know. The Who, Live at Leeds. You know, that's the stuff that, yeah. Jimi Hendrix, Are You Experienced? I used to walk around with that album in high school under my arm, and I'd take it everywhere, you know? And I used to look at the back of the cover, look at the front, look at the back, look at the front. I mean, Hendrix was such an innovator. 
you know. I mean, all my idols, you know, are blues-based guitar players pretty much, but Hendrix just, you know, Hendrix is like one of a kind kind of guitar player. He, you know, he approached the guitar from, uh, you know, a different mindset, and uh, you know, he's somebody I would have loved to work with. I know my producer Eddie Kramer, you know, worked with him on several records, and he told me stories about Jimmy and you know how amazing he was in the studio and, sp you know, the spontaneous stuff that would come out, you know, and uh, that would be somebody, you know, if, if we could raise him from the dead, you know, me and Jimmy. That would be my uh, my dream uh, collaboration. Yeah, Eddie's the original man. Eddie Eddie Kramer definitely helped us to uh, got our record deal. You know, he's so cool, Eddie. He man, look at let's he's done Hendrix, my lord, Zeppelin. You know, I don't know if people realize Eddie's roots and who he's done. I mean, I love Eddie Kramer. I've known Eddie a long, long time, and uh, my heart, I, I love the man. He's a great guy, man. I think in some ways all bands are dysfunctional. Often part of the reason people get involved in rock and roll in the first place is because they themselves are dysfunctional. If you get lucky, you find camaraderie and some sort of chemistry. The fact that you each feel different brings you together. And certainly it's nice to be part of a club of misfits. Life is easier with a support system. In KISS, we had a collective reason for being, but outside of that, we didn't have a lot in common. So we didn't socialize together outside of the band. Ace and Peter had a lot of friends, and Peter was already married. Gene had a girlfriend. I was still pretty isolated outside of the band. When the other guys joked around with each other, I chimed in. When they made fun of me, however, I didn't take it well. I never betrayed why I was sensitive. I sure as hell wasn't going to expose myself to potential ridicule by telling them about how shattering my experiences as a child had been as a result of my ear and deafness. I wasn't going to bring up painful things with people who might use those things against me. Peter, it quickly became apparent, was also a very troubled person. He seemed to get off on causing problems within the band. One night after rehearsal, we all went down to the Chinese restaurant. Peter started making fun of the waiter in a really derogatory way. We found his behavior embarrassing and told him that if he didn't stop, we would leave the restaurant. Peter said, if you leave the restaurant, I'm quitting the band. He kept it up. We got up and left. And sure enough, he quit the band for a few days. I grew up in Brooklyn. It was a tough neighborhood. A lot of gangs. I was in gangs. I, I saw some, my fair share of, of uh, danger, uh, of violence. I was violent. I was in a gang. I did. In, I was making guns and selling them for five bucks a gun in my life when I was younger. Uh, it was the only way to survive in Brooklyn. You either join a gang or they bring or they make you join them or you get beat up every day of your life so i was hard i was a tougher the toughest kid in the band wow. uh, no doubt about it gene and paul were from queens much nicer neighborhood ace was from the bronx nowhere as tough as my neighborhood and so i had an edge to me that was was great i guess for a drummer because drummers should be crazy we should be animals we should bash things and i love to bash things and i had a major temper then and i was an angry young man. I was an angry drummer. And I and I think it, I got it out every night on them drums. Thank God I would have I, I would have been a murderer maybe. <laughs> I would have been around axing people and chopping people up or shooting people if I didn't. So much of my energy sometimes used to, I mean my hands would be bleeding. Uh, I would play, I played one toe with two broken hands in a cast. I put the stick in and still played that I had so much uh, Tent up stuff for me that I was not happy with a lot of things. Ace didn't do things to sabotage the band at that point. Though lazy, he was smart and funny. He constantly told jokes. He liked to drink, but it didn't affect our work, at least in the beginning. Once I got together with Kiss and, you know, we signed a record deal, we, you know, we all went to this music store on 48th Street called Manny's Music, you know, and we all picked out new Marshall amps and, and guitars, and, and uh, I picked out my first uh, tobacco burst, Les Paul. It was a standard back then, and you know, eventually I graduated to a custom, and then I ended up customizing mine, and Gibson liked what I did, and the rest is history, history. You would 